So um, I guess uh, please, uh, please take it away. All right, so my name is Amanda Barrett. I am the best-selling and award-winning author of numerous historical novels and novellas, and I'm here today to talk about my latest novel, The Warsaw Sisters, which is set in World War II Poland. So in my presentation, Resistance and Resilience, the true stories that inspired the Warsaw Sisters, I'm going to be sharing a bit about the history that inspired the novel. In exploring the multifaceted narrative of history, the stories I am most drawn to are those I call the courage of the commonplace. Ordinary people who, when thrust into times that test the very substance of humanity, fight with quiet resilience to uphold and preserve that which should be most sacred to society, freedom, human dignity, and human life itself. Their stories are profoundly compelling, but have, as is so often the case, been lost in the shadows of history. So tonight, today, for these few minutes we have together, I'm going to introduce you to a few of them. So won't you journey um, with me to Warsaw, you seem to be, uh, a city that survived a its own death? What? Um, you seem to be freezing a little bit. Okay, okay you... let me see. Is it back to not freezing? Uh, it still seems to be freezing a little bit. I'm not sure if that's my connection or... Okay, now it's better. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, usually if I if that happens, I'll get something on there that will say like your internet connection is unstable and I'm not seeing that right now. So Okay. All right. All right. So on September first, nineteen thirty nine, Hitler's troops invaded Poland. This act would catapult not only Germany and Poland, but in time a great portion of the world into what we now call the Second World War. The surrender of Warsaw, Poland's capital, 28 days later marked the start of more than five years of occupation, brutality, and unrelenting terror for the people of Warsaw. This vibrant city of over a million inhabitants fell under the administration of what was called the General Government, a part of Poland under German occupation but not incorporated into the German Reich. Street raids, arrests, and deportations to forced labor in Germany or concentration camps became a fact of daily life for all Polish citizens. One historian wrote that nowhere in all Nazi-occupied Europe was the extensive mach machinery of repression as great as it was in Poland. More than 5 million Polish citizens perished during the Second World War, approximately 3 million Jews among them. In the autumn of 1940, the occupation authorities ordered the establishment of what they called the Jewish district in the city of Warsaw. It would become the largest ghetto in occupied Poland. In time, 460,000 people would reside within the ghetto, an area of 1.3 square miles, surrounded by a 10 foot high brick wall crowned with barbed wire and bits of broken glass to prevent anyone from trying to escape by scaling it. The ghetto had been established in an area of the city where many of the Buildings were run down and lacked modern amenities. In many flats, six to seven people shared one room. Think about that for a minute. Imagine sharing a room with six other people, some of them strangers, not just for a day or two, but month after month. Imagine walking down the street and passing children on the sidewalks begging for bread, and you have to turn away from their cries because you don't even have enough to feed your own family. Imagine seeing the body of someone who had died from starvation lying on the street, and imagine becoming used to that sight because it was so common. Imagine a, a deadly epidemic, typhus, spreading rapidly in the fear of one of your family members falling victim. And again, because it's so crowded, how do you protect your family? How do you try and keep your clothes free from lice? These were the realities faced by the ghetto inhabitants. Between 1940 and mid-1942, 83,000 people died, mainly from disease and starvation. But the worst was yet to come. In July 1942, the occupation authorities ordered the deportation of the ghetto's population. Each day, a human quota of between six to 7,000 men, women, and children had to be met. They were rounded up and loaded into rail cars. The official announcement stated that these people were being sent to do labor in the East. The German authorities even offered an incentive. Anyone who volunteers for resettlement will receive three kilos of bread and one kilo of marmalade. With starvation widespread, many people reported voluntarily for deportation. They did indeed receive their three kilos of bread and they were crowded into the rail cars. The majority of the trains arrived at a station near a village called Treblinka, approximately 50 miles northeast of Warsaw. Nearby was one of the three camps established as part of Operation Reinhardt, the Nazi plan to eliminate the Jewish population. At this camp, almost which was almost completely surrounded, 
camouflaged by the surrounding forest from July 22nd to late September, 265,000 to 300,000 Jewish men, women, and children from the Warsaw Ghetto were gassed with carbon monoxide in specially prepared chambers. These figures might seem intangible until you think that this isn't just a number. It's 265,000 human lives. It's 265,000 murders. But in the midst of all this, there was light, candle flames of hope. One of these lights was a network organized and operated primarily by women. One of them was a Warsaw social worker in her early 30s named Irena Sendler. Due to her position at the Warsaw Welfare Department, Irena and a few colleagues managed to obtain passes authorizing them to enter the ghetto on matters of sanitation and epidemic control. Irena had Jewish friends, and contrary to the anti-Semitism, which was regrettably widespread in Poland at the time, she was determined not to ignore what was happening. At first, in the early days of the ghetto, these women secretly brought food, medicine, and typhus vaccines into the walled district. But as time passed, they embarked on an even more dangerous undertaking, smuggling children out. Keep in mind that at this time in Poland, the occupation authorities had clearly stated the penalty for not only for a Jewish person caught outside the ghetto, but a non-Jew who provided them aid or shelter those people would be executed. This was a far more extreme measure than what was implemented in other countries in occupied Europe, such as France and the Netherlands, when the penalty would be imprisonment in a concentration camp. But Irena and her colleagues remained dauntless. Their efforts grew in urgency as deportations to Treblinka began and news about the true fate of those in the transports began to trickle out. Irena and her colleagues used a variety of methods to smuggle children out. Through the law courts, which could be accessed from both the ghetto and the outside world, through cellars and buildings bordering the ghetto, in ambulances and trams, in crates and sacks, in work brigades leaving the ghetto, and even through the sewer canals. Irena later recounted how fearful parents pressed her for assurances about their child's safety. I spoke frankly, she said. I said I couldn't even be certain I would safely leave the ghetto with a child that very day. Scenes from hell ensued. For instance, the father would agree to give us the child, but the mother would refuse. Sometimes I would leave such a family with their child. The next day I would return to see what happened to the family and frequently it would turn out that the entire family was already in the Umschlagplatz, which was the collection point for the deportations. Imagine being a mother in that situation. News about the fate of those in the transports had begun to circulate, but for many the reality of mass murder was almost unfathomable. The heart rate in choice between separation from your child or remaining together to face whatever known, unknown awaited, how to make such a choice, how to trust your child's life to a stranger, yet these mothers did. Irena always said they were the true heroines. Once a child had been brought outside the ghetto, they would be taken to what was called an emergency care unit. These were homes throughout the city and the surrounding area where a child would be cared for in their first days outside the ghetto. They would be given a food and a bath, their clothes would be cleaned, and they would be taught Catholic prayers and other necessities of survival. For in crossing to the other side of the wall, these children would become the hunted. Those who rescued these children are remembered as heroes, but their heroism wasn't established in a single act. It was day after day of choices, actions, risks, and sacrifices. I think when we ask ourselves, what would I have done in that situation? That's something we need to remember. It wasn't just one choice. It was countless choices, some small, some great. And in those choices, in that daily faithfulness, that really is the true substance of heroism. After a stay in one of the emergency care units, the children would be provided with false documents and placed in orphanages, religious institutions, or foster families. In late 1942, Irena made contact with the newly founded organization, the Council for Aged Jews, known by its cryptonym Zagoda. Irena became head to the sec of the section dedicated to providing aid to children. Irena's work continued until late October 1943, when the Gestapo arrived at her flat early one morning. There had been an arrest of a woman who used her laundry shop as an underground contact point. Interrogated and tortured, the woman betrayed Irena's name. As the Gestapo stormed up the stairs to her flat, Irena managed to quickly give the small rolls of tissue paper on which she had written information about the children helped by the network to a friend and fellow network member who had been visiting at the time. The woman quickly concealed them under her dress. Irena was taken to the infamous detention center on Sucha Avenue. The Gestapo didn't suspect Irena, a blonde woman in her early 30s who was barely five feet tall, could possibly be a leader in the underground, a bit player maybe, who put under enough pressure could reveal information about her superiors. They tortured her brutally during the weeks of her imprisonment. Both her legs were broken and for the rest of her life, Irena suffered from pain as a result. But Irena resolutely betrayed no one because she alone knew where all the children had been placed. Her colleagues in Jagoda set out to rescue her and succeeded in bribing a Gestapo officer for her release. One day, her name was called out among those sentenced for execution, but at the last moment, she was led away and went free. 
Now Irena was the one to assume a false identity. When her mother passed away, Irena couldn't even attend the funeral for fear the Gestapo might be watching. The exact number of children helped by Irena and her colleagues remains unknown. According to testimony compiled by Irena and three of her closest associates in 1979, the Children's Department of Zagoda aided as many as 2,500 children. Whatever the number, each small life left a legacy outlasting the darkness. Before the war, Poland was home to nearly 1 million Jewish children under the age of 14. Of those children who remained in Poland during the war, only an estimated 5,000 survived, and most had lost one or both parents. In 1965, Yad Vashem recognized Irena Sendler as righteous among the nations, but the Soviet regime in Poland refused to authorize Irena's passport, so she couldn't even travel to Jerusalem to accept the award. Though the name of Irena Sendler has become renowned, she was only one of a courageous fraternity. She later said, I could not have achieved anything were it not for that group of women I trusted who were with me in the ghetto every day and who transferred their homes into care centers for children. These were exceptionally brave and noble people. As for me, it was simple. I remembered what my father had taught me. When someone is drowning, you give him your hand. I simply tried to extend my hand to the Jewish people. Despite the swift consequences for resistance, a thriving underground sprang up in Poland in the immediate aftermath of occupation. By 1940, a year after Poland was occupied, 140 separate underground groups had been formed in Warsaw alone. The history of the unification of the Polish resistance is complex, but on February 14th, 1942, the organization officially became known as the Armia Krajowa, the Home Army. The Home Army wasn't merely a resistance group, but the armed forces of the Polish underground state, subordinate to the government in exile in London. By 1940, it had become one of the largest resistance movements in occupied Europe, with over 350,000 soldiers throughout Poland. During the occupation, the Home Army carried out all manner of resistance, from the so-called small sabotage operations, such as distributing leaflets and painting the anchor symbol of the underground on walls, to blowing up trains supplying the Eastern Front to carry out executions of members of the Gestapo and SS. Young women were key figures in the Home Army as they could easily walk through the streets of Warsaw, carrying underground newspapers in their handbags or ammunition in their market baskets, innocuous girls who became steely foot soldiers. The Home Army also amassed weapons and trained their members in preparation for future battle. The idea of a larger coordinated insurrection had been brewing for some time, but it was not known where it would take place or whether Warsaw would be involved. Flash forward to the summer of 1944. Germany's defeat seemed not only possible, but inevitable. The advancing Red Army forced German troops to retreat and German civil authorities evacuated Warsaw in droves as the Soviets surged across Poland in a massive offensive operation. The Allied invasion of Normandy began in June and the attempt on Hitler's life on the 20th of July gave further evidence of the collapse of the Reich. With the Soviets approaching Warsaw and the Germans fleeing, this seemed an opportune time for action. Not only would the uprising be a battle against the hated occupiers, but a political move against the Soviets and the threat of communist rule, which would simply mean trading one occupation for another. The Polish people would reclaim their city, Poles liberating, instead of being liberated. On the evening of July 31st, the leadership of the Home Army issued the order for the uprising to begin at 5 p.m. the following day. On August 1st, thousands of men and women filled the streets of Warsaw, hurrying to their posts in silent accord. They wore overcoats to conceal weapons and carried rucksacks and parcels filled with ammunition and supplies. At various points throughout the city, they assembled, donning white and red armbands that had been stitched and stamped by female members of the Home Army. On the first day of the battle, only 10% of insurgents had weapons. Many were armed with only a single hand grenade, most manufactured by the Home Army in clandestine factories. In the first days of the battle for Warsaw, an atmosphere of freedom and exhilaration prevailed as the Home Army captured large swaths of the city. However, they failed to gain control of key bridges, railway stations, airports, and main military and police installations. The Home Army began the uprising with the expectation that the Soviet Army would reach the city in a matter of days and provide military support. But the Soviets did not arrive, and soon the time began to shift. In response to the Polish insurrection, Hitler and Himmler issued the order, Every citizen of Warsaw is to be killed, including men, women, and children. Warsaw has to be leveled to the ground in order to set a terrifying example to the rest of Europe. German reinforcements mounted a counterattack, and as they overtook the districts Vola and Ohota, they ruthlessly murdered civilians. The Vola massacre would become the largest single battlefield massacre of the Second World War. Over the course of only a week, an estimated 40,000 to 50,000 civilians in Vola alone were rounded up and slaughtered by SS and police units. One of the most devastating testimonies of the massacre in Vola came from a woman named Vanda Lurie. 
Vanda was rounded up and taken to a factory complex in Vola where executions were being carried out. She was heavily pregnant and with her were her three children aged 11, six and three and a half. Waiting in a mass of people, listening to shots coming from within the factory grounds, surrounded by guards, Vanda tried to keep to the back of the line for as long as she could, hoping something would happen, somehow rescue would come. But in the end, she and her children were forced through the gates into the factory grounds where they saw heaps of corpses, hundreds and hundreds of bodies. Vanda pleaded with the guard to save her and her children, offering him some jewelry as a bribe. The guard seemed ready to accept, but the officer in charge intervened, shoving them back into the group awaiting execution. Vanda's three children were shot in front of her and fell among the mound of bodies. Vanda too was shot but survived. Wounded, she lay among the growing pile of corpses as more people were brought to the factory as the killing went on. For three days, Vanda remained there, lying beside the bodies of her children. Only when she felt her unborn baby inside her kicking for life did Vanda gather the strength to rise and somehow she managed to escape the factory. As August passed, German artillery and bombers besieged Warsaw's old town. Their bombing missions started early in the morning and continued every half hour until evening, decimating buildings and leading to immense loss of civilian life. These civilians, mothers with young children, the elderly, found themselves in the front lines of an increasingly desperate battle. They took refuge in cellars where they remained for weeks, running out of food, water increasingly scarce, trapped, and waiting for whatever rend would come. Throughout the course of the uprising, 40 to 50,000 people thousand to 50,000 people took part in the home army, around 12,000 women among them. They served as couriers, nurses, and combatants, suffering and sacrificing as soldiers. Exploring their stories was a profoundly moving experience. I think of Christina, only a teenager when the uprising broke out. She became a medic and stretcher bearer, scrambling over rubble to collect the wounded and carry them to first aid post, one of the many teenage girls functioning as makeshift ambulances. She had only basic medical training and the home army had limited access to medical supplies. You get used to seeing blood, she later said, but you don't get used to suffering. Other women served as couriers. Often they were the only link between units because the home army didn't have field telephones. They delivered messages under fire at risk of bombs, artillery, and snipers. To make sure a message would get through, often a home army commander would send two courier girls with the same message, for if one was killed on the way, the other would hopefully still be able to deliver the necessary information. Many who served in the armed army were in their teens and early 20s. They were young and idealistic. As woman, one woman who served as a courier later recalled, we were ready to give everything, absolutely everything, for freedom. In the heightened atmosphere of battle, romances blossomed and bonds deepened. A ravaged city may seem an improbable place for a wedding, but more than 250 marriages took place during the uprising. These ceremonies were rushed, unions officiated by priests who spent the majority of the fighting offering comfort to the dying and holding services for the fallen. In these desperate times, young couples clung to any semblance of normalcy. A groom picked flowers from an overgrown balcony, a bride borrowed a clean blouse from a friend, couples exchanged curtain rings in place of wedding bands. One evening, a young home army soldier who went by the pseudonym of Hawk and his sweetheart Helena decided to marry. During a reprieve in the artillery fire, they made their way to a cathedral. One of the witnesses at their wedding had to be carried in on the back of one of his friends as he'd been hit in the legs on his way to the church. Hawk and Helena pledged themselves to one another before a priest. After a brief celebration, everyone returned to their posts. Within moments, the artillery barrage resumed. Both Hawk and Helena were killed. In their death as in their love, they were united. District after district fell as the weeks passed. Home army soldiers fought fiercely and suffered heavy casualties. The battalion in my novel suffered a casualty rate of 70%. Nearly all of the soldiers in that battalion were in their teens and early 20s. Among the fallen were some of Poland's finest youth, poets, musicians, and artists. As one man said, we are part of a nation whose fate is to shoot at the enemy with diamonds. Finally, with the city a wasteland, the home army desperately short of ammunition and weapons, the civilians starving, the home army surrendered on October 2nd, 1944, having fought for 63 days. As many as 180,000 civilians and 18,000 home army soldiers perished. After the surrender of the Home Army, the Germans expelled nearly the entire population of Warsaw. They were processed through a transit camp and deported to forced labor in Germany or simply sent to other parts of Poland. Others were sent to concentration camps, including Auschwitz. Home Army soldiers became POWs. Following the suppression of the uprising, Hitler reiterated the order that the city be razed to the ground, an act of revenge which had no military grounds whatsoever. After the city was looted, crews with flamethrowers and dynamite annihilated what remained. The destruction of Warsaw amounted to over 80% of all buildings. 
On January 17, 1945, the Soviets entered Warsaw, but the post-war years proved Poland and its citizens had not regained independence. Under the Stalinist regime, veterans of the Home Army were hunted and persecuted. Thousands were imprisoned or deported to labor camps. Many were executed. One former courier had a one-year-old son at the time of her arrest. Her imprisonment lasted more than five years. The repression of former insurgents eased in the mid-1950s, but only with the fall of communism in 1989 could the re restoration of memory and identity begin. But from her ruins, Warsaw emerged reborn. The meticulous reconstruction of much of the old town took place in the decades after the war, centuries of architecture resurrected from rubble. Today, Warsaw is once more a vibrant capital city of over a million inhabitants, but the scars of war remain embedded in her landscape. Still, every year at five o'clock on August 1st, sirens resound across Warsaw and in towns and cities all over Poland. For 60 seconds, traffic stops and pedestrians still. Even as the sirens swell, a hush descends over the city that rose for freedom and rose again from her ashes. Bringing these stories to the page was a process of exploration and discovery, a journey that led me from stacks upon stacks of books as I sought to gain a perspective not only of the historical panorama, but also the deeply personal experiences of individuals, to the museum that housed a collection of archives related to the Polish resistance. I held a cap and a helmet worn by home army soldiers during the uprising. I stood in front of the case holding copies of the underground newspaper published by the resistance, the same newspaper that young courier girls used to smuggle in their satchels to distribute words of freedom. It was a personal journey because my great grandparents immigrated from Poland and Polish culture and traditions formed a part of my childhood. Story is a powerful vehicle for remembrance. And as more and more Holocaust survivors and World War II veterans pass each year, remembrance and the preservation of history becomes even more imperative. I wrote the Warsaw Sisters as a tribute to what I call the sparks of light in the night of war, the ordinary who quietly resisted. Their legacy is one of courage birthed by adversity and extraordinary sacrifice. They did not seek to become heroes, yet the imprint of their heroism endures. So usually now I open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions they would like to ask. So you're certainly welcome to ask any questions you would like if there's anything else that you'd like me to speak about. I know we'd only have a couple of attendees right now, but. Oh, I'm unmuted. I think Kevin said he had some questions. So um, Kevin, did you have some questions? You can either uh, put them in the chat or um, or speak out, whichever whichever works better for you. And then anyone who's watching on Facebook uh, can also ask some questions. Um, so anyone, Kevin? I think you're, you're still muted, but I can unmute you if you want to ask in person. Um, OK, I guess I, I have a few. So our, um, so the, the oh, Kevin, you're unmuted. Okay. Oh, how long did did it take you to come out with the with the book? It took me. The writing process for this book was the research was a couple of years, and then the writing was a couple of years. So total, the whole process was around three years, both research, writing, and editing. Because I'm coming out with the with the. With the uh, book, I'm actually writing a book with one of my with one of my uh, friends. His name is um, Zach. He has okay. Um, he has the condition that I have. I have um, DP. So, um, we are coming out with the with the book. Um, I want to try to get it out there in twenty twenty six or in twenty twenty five. I want to try to get it out there. Um, but it it's taking. So long. Yeah. Um, come out with the book. 
So yeah, Kevin, it's all good to promote your own stuff, but uh, let's kind of stick to talking about um, Amanda's book right now, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so, so are you the author of the of the uh, of the book? Yes, yes, yes. I wrote the Warsaw Sisters. Oh. Where can yeah. Where can you where can you find it? Um the novel is available for purchase on all major online retailers, so Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um basically wherever books are sold. Oh. Um, so yeah, I had some questions as well. I um you mentioned a lot of a lot of people um when you were talking about it. So um, your your two lead characters, I guess, are in, um, Antonina and Helena um, Dabrowska. Am I pronouncing that right? Pro probably not. Dabrowska, yes, Dabrowska. Oh, okay. Um, so did you combine a lot of the women's stories that you were mentioning within those um, two characters? Yes, very much so. Reading and researching all of them, I was able to really bring little bits of the various women and kind of pull them into my fictional characters, really in the hope of honoring the real courageous women who live those experiences. And um, did you feature some of the women that you um, mentioned as actual historical figures? I think, um, was it Irina who was the one who was captured and tortured? Or was that, I think you said Irina, right? Yes. Irena Sendler, yes, she is featured in the novel as a, she makes a cameo appearance. My character Antonina works with Irena's network to shelter the Jewish children smuggled out of the ghetto. Um, so um, did you find any aspects of writing the book um, particularly challenging or particularly um, either emotionally or just, um, yeah, I guess just emotionally, because you said you have ancestors, I think, who were involved in the resistance or who came from Poland. Yes, writing this book was a profoundly emotional experience, delving into the very heartbreaking history of Poland's story in the Second World War, which I think a lot of people maybe don't really know Poland's story. They may know the basics, but a lot of these details, I think if I asked a lot, I've asked a lot of people, have you heard of the Warsaw Uprising of 1944? And very few Americans have. And so it was, you know, it was both, it was very humbling to be able to bring that to the story and to honor their and illuminate their courage. The most difficult part was the research and finding sources. There are a lot more um, Polish language sources written about World War II. And since I um, I speak a little Polish, but not well enough to read an entire book. So some of that, I used a lot of different translation software to translate certain documents. And um, so yes, the research process, it was both very challenging, but very exhilarating, just being able to explore this very fascinating history that is not often known. Um, so did you actually travel to Poland to do research? Um, I wrote I this novel during the midst of the pandemic, so I wasn't really oh, okay. able to go over there. There was a museum um, that lives a few hours from where I live, like I said, that has a collection of archives related to the home army and had some things that I was able to go see. But to travel to Poland, that wasn't possible, although it's my, definitely my hope to take a trip there, um, as there's so many places I would like to see. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I imagine it would have added a new, another element to be able to travel there, but at least you got some. Um, so um, let's see. Are you planning on writing any sort of follow-up to this book about dealing with maybe the Soviet era or um, since you talked about that a little bit? You're actually the second... You're the second person who's actually asked me that recently if I was thinking about pull, taking and following these same characters through the, the Soviet occupation. And my next novel is also going to be set during World War II, but it isn't going to follow these same characters. It's going to explore a different story of resistance. But it certainly would be fascinating because I think a lot of people don't really know what Poland endured in the 1950s with uh, under the Stalinist regime. Yeah, I, I think I fall into the category of knowing just a little bit, you know, I've heard of the Prague, the Prague Spring, oh no, wait, that's Czechoslovakia. Um, 
Well, I know there was some resistance and I know there was oppression, um, but I don't know a lot of the details. Are you guys writing, are you writing in a, another book for kids? Or um, just, I th um, or see. just, I turned off um, a book for uh, grown ups. My novels are more adult fiction. They can be read by teenagers, but they're primarily for adult readers. Okay. Um, so let's see, I'm looking on Facebook. It looks like no one has really asked any questions on there. Um, but um, if people have other questions, I guess I can um, maybe email you. Yes, yeah, so they're all people are always welcome to reach out to me um, via the contact form on my website, which is a amandabarrett.net. And so I they can certainly reach out if they have questions. And I I also always invite people to follow me on Facebook or in against in Instagram. Okay. Um, anything else that you wanted to add? Um, um I just I really I loved writing the novel and really hope it's been wonderful to see such a good response to it. Wonderful to hear even from people in Poland who have read the novel and been touched by it. So um, definitely hope people do check it out. Yeah, we may, we may do it as a future book club read. I have my uh, book club planned out for the next few months, but definitely it, um, it's a possibility. Um, more... oh, wonderful, yes. Can you... Can you send it to me? Uh, her, yeah, her, I can. Uh, uh, link. Yeah, I, I can do can that. Look, and I can look at it. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and I can send you information about the book too. Okay. And that um, goes for anyone who's uh, like more information who's watching this now or later. So what what does it take um to um to um to write the to write the book that you wrote Amanda it takes me around two years to write a novel around two years to complete a full length draft of a novel yeah so oh, so it it takes more than more than uh more than a couple months yes it's the research and writing it's very involved it's um i love doing it it's a, it's a wonderful process of both the research and writing but yeah it's a couple of years to do to write a novel um because yeah i'm trying to get my own book out but um it's gonna take me a little bit but I'm gonna write. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So, um, did this one involve more research than other books? I think I I noticed you mostly write um historical novels. It seems like. Um, the research process for this one was very similar to the research process for my last novel, Within These Walls of Sorrow, which was also set in Poland. That one was set in the Krakow ghetto. And so that one, so the research process for flowed very seamlessly from one to another. It was basically just building on the foundation and delving into more Warsaw specific um, topics. All right. Um, and I think you mentioned uh, Treblinka um, earlier. And as, as I recall, wasn't that concentration camp where there was an uprising actually in I think 43, 44. Um, I don't yes, know if that- Yes, there, there's, it's amazing the, the uprisings that occurred. I mean, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which is touched on briefly in my novel, um, is one of the most well-known, but there were uprisings in ghettos and camps throughout Poland. And I think you said the Warsaw Uprising was um, in 43, or what were the years? So there was the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943, which was involved the Jewish resistance. There were around 750 Jewish combatants who um, fought back when German soldiers came in to enact another deportation operation. And then the Warsaw Uprising of 1944, which was the uprising by the Polish resistance, the Home Army. Yeah, I know that I think the 1944 was the one that actually 
expanded into more of the final conflict with uh, the Nazis, as as you were describing. Yes, the yes, the one in 1943 was was very much involved, basically the ghetto, which is an extraordinary story of Jewish resistance that really is um, incredible, and I really um, enjoyed researching that. It was very inspiring. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so I guess we will keep an eye out for your other books, and um, and if we do this for the book club, maybe uh, maybe we can have you come and talk again. Yes, um, yes, you're welcome to reach out um, to me again. And I have a book club kit on my website um, that includes discussion questions, uh, Q&A with me, a recipe, and some other behind-the-scenes things that are often helpful when book clubs are reading one of my titles. Oh, okay. A, re a recipe could definitely be interesting. I don't know what Yes, the... a Polish recipe. Oh, okay. Is it a Polish resistance recipe? Because I imagine you were talking about all the shortages that they had. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I thought about including a recipe that would be very appropriate to the era, but then I figured people probably wouldn't enjoy eating it as much. So I just included a Polish cookie recipe that book clubs often would enjoy having. So, but the yeah. other recipe would be cool too. Yeah, that makes more sense. Um, all right. So um, unless um, Kevin had any more questions or thoughts. Um, um, how, um, if you don't mind me, asking where um how 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 um how old do you have to be to um become a, a author of the a, author of a um novel I know authors who are a variety of ages. I've met some authors who are in their late teens. Um, so I definitely have met a lot of younger authors. Oh. Um, so did you so start how do you actually, how do you, do you go to book club meetings to get information about writing the book that you wrote? I attended I attended a lot of conferences where um, I sat in a lot of classes that um, taught me and then I was able to um, just gain a lot of knowledge into the writing as well as I read a lot of books on the craft of writing. So what what other books are you gonna come out with in the in the um, future? Um, I'm currently working on another novel set during World War II that will probably release in the next few years. Um, uh, which one is that one? I don't have a title for it yet, as I'm still in those initial research process. But I'll be sharing all that information um in my author newsletter and on my website when it becomes available. Okay. Yeah, so, um, you said the Thank other you. one was. Um, you said the other one was Krakow, but so are all of your books going to be in different cities in Poland or? Um... Um, I'm still figuring out this next one. I, before the one that was in the Krakow ghetto, I had two that were set in Germany. One was about called The White Rose Resists, inspired by the true story of Sophie Scholl and um, who formed the White Rose Resistance Movement. They were college students in Germany who produced and wrote leaflets, um, anti-Nazi resistance leaflets. And they were, uh, many of them were imprisoned and executed for their activities. So that was um, that novel that was set in Germany. Um, all right, so I will, um, I think uh, this gives us a lot to think about. And as I said, um, we, um, Doing your book for the book club is definitely a possibility, and um, I may reach out to Nelson. you again. Nelson, thank you, can so much, I, Warren. Can I um, can I join the book club? Sure. Um, we're meeting tomorrow, so I don't know if you'll have enough time to actually have read the book we're currently reading, but um, certainly next month. Um, so um, um, what what is the book that you're that you're currently reading um so um i can talk more to you about that later um i think we'll just keep focusing on um amanda's work for right now but i'll i'll reach out to you later all right okay 
Okay, you can reach out to me or email me or reach out to me via um Alexa or email me whenever okay. Okay. whenever you are you are ready to read the book or talk about the book. Okay. Because okay. I it was nice to meet you, Amanda. It was so nice to meet you as well. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you. Thanks welcome. for joining, and I'll um I'll be sharing the recording around, and I hope uh, people will check it out, and um I'll reach out with any questions that people might have, or they can reach out to you directly. Um, thank you. Yes, thank um, you, Warren. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. You have a good um, rest and, of your day. Um, and I can send.